So, thank you for coming and welcome to this first session. This is the first session that we're running in a series of at least six line manager training sessions for those of you in schools. The reason that we are running this session is that we work in education because we really care about the sector. And at the minute, you are doing so much to keep everything going. You're running schools with a tiny proportion of students in. You're having to teach students at home at the same time, whilst also finding some way to run your own personal life in a pandemic. And for those of you who have got children, I have absolute sympathy with trying to do anything resembling a day job whilst having young children. And I really hope you don't see mine running back and forth throughout this session. So we got to thinking, what can we do? So one thing we can do is do some personal development for you. It's free, it's, we'll, we'll do it for as many people as we can. So if you find it useful, tell your colleagues and we'll run additional sessions if we need to. This session is gonna be about absence management. We're gonna keep it short, it's gonna be half an hour. We're gonna be doing the headlines of what you need to know in terms of line management, particularly looking at things to have in the back of your mind. We can talk all day about this, so it's not gonna give you the full detail, but it's gonna give you some really specific tips that you can take back to your day job when we ever get back to anything resembling a normal day job. So we're going to start off with a quick poll and here's the first test of whether the tech works. So hopefully in a second you should see a poll on your screen. We've got three questions for you and the first one is just a benchmarker for the group. Um, Hopefully, we should have a question that says, how confident are you in managing absence? Tom, can you see that on your screen? Yes. Brilliant. We've got some people voting. Fantastic. It's working. <laughs> um, okay. And can you see the results, Tom, as well? Yeah. Brilliant. Okay. So I'm hoping everyone will be able to see that, but I'll publish them at the end if not. Okay. So in terms of how confident we are in managing sickness absence, out of those of you who've voted so far, we've got a real mix. Some of you are brand new. Most of you are here for a refresher, which is good. And we're going to get really difficult questions from currently 5% of you. So we look forward to that. Um, okay. The second two questions are about, are about benchmarking what we think we can do, about kind of those myths about what it really means to manage absence. So should you always follow occupational health advice? Almost 50% of you have said yes, 50% of you have said no. Most of the time, you should follow occupational health advice. You get that advice for a reason, but there are certainly circumstances where it's not the best practice thing to do. And we're gonna look into that, Tom's gonna to go into that in more detail. What we're looking at here is making reasoned judgments that work for you as an organization. Um, and taking that back into your practice to give you the confidence to know when you should and when you might want to take a slightly different approach. Third question, is it possible to dismiss an employee with a disability through absence management? 20% um, of you are saying no. And the answer is that there are some limited circumstances where that might be possible. It's going to be potentially risky and there's moral questions about what you might want to do, but there are some circumstances which we'll have a look at where yes, it might be the appropriate thing to do for the best interests of your organization. It's these kind of slightly more difficult questions which we're gonna get into the detail of. And that's a good benchmark, I think, of where we are in terms of the session. Okay, so Tom, off you go. Thank you. Um, so, there's quite a lot of detail on the slides. Um, so I'm going to try and pull out the relevant bits, but like Heather said, this is a bit of a refresher. So um, the purpose of it is just some supplementary tips and techniques. The first few slides I'll go through fairly quickly as um, a lot of it's just background, but there's some, there's some key bits I wanted to pull out. So first thing we often obviously look at is why is managing absence important? Um, depending on your roles, it can be sometimes quite difficult to get the support you need at certain levels. Um, so it's quite good to look at the, the benefits in managing absence. Um, the big one, I think, at the minute and probably the last five, six years has been the financial costs. So obviously a lot of schools have had a huge reduction in funding. Um, when you look at statistics across the sector, most secondary schools, absence probably costs over 100,000 a year. Uh, primaries is obviously slightly less. But if you're a trust of 10 schools, then arguably you're spending around a million pounds on absence. Um, when we talk about absence cost, it's the cost of paying the sick pay, it's the cover, it's the pension on cost, it's kind of all, all the costs included. Um, 
I think the big one at the minute, the kind of second prong to it is obviously well-being. Um, you would have seen not just in education, but across kind of private and public sector, there's been a huge push on well-being and work-life balance. Um, that's something that possibly when and, and if we get back to normal, um, unions will start picking up on again. There was a lot of unions um, doing a lot of work around well-being and things. So some of this might tie in with with separate well-being policies. If you have, there's a couple of um, kind of strategic tips we've got for managing absence that will fit in quite nicely with well-being. So how to manage absence? Again, these are fairly hopefully obvious ones. Um, the kind of three things I wanted to pull out of this that the main th kind of areas I'd advise you to look at is your policy um, is it fit for purpose and we'll look a little bit more detail about what that looks like um, but I'm still seeing a lot of academy trusts if, if you are a trust that use old local authority policies that maybe are quite employee focused they're really long-winded they might have certain time restrictions as to when you can manage absence um, so I've seen some local authority policies that says you can't begin to manage it until maybe they're on to half pay, which for some people can be 100, 100 days in, which is obviously a huge amount of time. Um, the other big one is using trigger points. This is something that seems fairly obvious, but most of the clients I work with aren't necessarily as kind of strategic and hot on the trigger points. Um, and there's various reasons for that that we'll come on to shortly. And then... Um, Return to work interviews is, is probably the other big one. Um, we're not going to focus too much on that just because there's a whole separate session on it. Um, but there are some case studies where I've seen schools that haven't done return to work interviews and then they've implemented them really well. And in that time frame, they've managed to demonstrate about £80,000 of savings just from doing return to work meetings well. So it, it really is worth looking at. Um, so this is what we would say a good absence management policy looks like. And this is for long term and short term. So you have three stages, regardless of whether it's long term or short term. So if they hit a trigger point, whether it be a short term or a long term, it involves a, a stage one meeting. Um, most of the policies I see, they issue actual warnings for short term absence. And that's why there's three stages. So you can have first written warning final written warning and then stage three is possible dismissal with long-term absence most don't issue actual warnings but they obviously warn the employee that it could lead to dismissal um, so this is pretty simple um, for absence management it's really clear for for us on terms of how to manage it and it's really clear for employees so if you've got a quite a long-winded policy or it's different for short term and long term and you do have the flexibility to review your policy this is a really good starting point um, we've got templates and things if you if you use us for hr we can help with that so do get in touch um, and i appreciate you might not all be hr professionals but if, if you're a line manager and you've struggled to manage absence then possibly start with the, with the policy um, so how to manage manage absence um, this really is, is looking at triggers um, and we'll come on to it shortly in terms of what good and bad triggers might look like um, I think the big one for me is probably the final bullet point what information goes to governors or board you know do you discuss absence and the impact of it at senior leadership team meetings um, I used to work for a large trust and we did because we knew the impact financially and educationally um, you will have seen there's bit, been an increasing kind of drive from the DfE around reporting on absence and the cost of absences now for schools and trusts um, because they know it's costing a huge amount of money um, and equally if your primary schools Ofsted are starting to look at how you manage absence in terms of agency workers and things because of the, the need for consistent teaching particularly at primary level um, so if you can get it at governor level it might seem counterintuitive to do it but obviously if you can get the backing at that level it should give you the resources if you need to look at your policy or if you need to look at maybe a HR system or you just need you know a bit of a drive from the top to manage absence that's a really good place to get them on board um, so a good tip when we talk about absence is is just to look at the impact and it's really important obviously in schools as you you I don't want to say only work because I know you all go above and beyond but the contracted days particularly for teachers is, is 195 days so obviously if a teacher's been off for 100 working days that's not a third of the year it's actually 50 percent of their contracted time so it's a good way of showing the impact essentially on teaching and learning 
Um, and like I said, if you do it over working days, it, it's, it's quite useful. Um, some schools put up um, the, the actual cost of absence. I know quite a few schools in September in their inset days, they put the cost of absence up on the whiteboard for all staff to see. And it's quite a powerful tool, particularly given the current climate. Um, so short term um, absence. Most schools have a policy that probably says maybe five or six instances that would trigger your short term absence management. Um, a really good tip is to have any other pattern of absence that may cause concern as a trigger. And that's because you can just catch the people that kind of fall in between. So if you have five instances for short term absence and four weeks for long term, I could go off three times for three weeks each time and that wouldn't hit one of those triggers. But obviously that's going to have a huge impact. So if you have any other pattern of absence that may cause concern, you can catch the people that might fall between. Um, the kind of big question we get asked on short term absence is, is, is around setting review periods and targets. And this is where it's quite useful to look at whether they have a disability or not. Um, and you'll notice there's a big theme throughout this that looks at if they have a disability or not. So if they've got a disability, you're expected to make adjustments. So review periods and targets is a really good opportunity to do that. So most of the schools I work with set review periods that kind of line up with term. So they'll either do a, a half term review period or a term review period. Um, most I know might set, if there's no disability, no more than one day off in half a term. Because if you look at that over a year, it's around five or six days a year, which would fall in with your natural trigger point. You can't expect somebody to have no time off, even if they don't have a disability, because obviously everyone gets ill with a cold or whatever. Um, if they do have a disability, you might say we'll set um, no more than two days. And then you can show, well, we actually doubled the target for them as a reasonable adjustment. So that's a really good kind of starting point um, if you're dealing with somebody with a disability. Um, the other big one is just don't leave it too long. Obviously, once they've hit a trigger, they've hit the trigger. And the longer you leave, you leave formally managing it, the longer you're leaving them on the books and the harder it could be to eventually manage them and move them on, which might be the um, end game for some of them. So long term, fairly similar approach. Um, so like I say, most would set, you know, if you're not back within four weeks, six weeks, we'll have no choice but to move to the next stage. Again, if they have a disability, it's worth extending that time frame. Um, we'll come on to 08 shortly. I won't spend most of the time looking at that because there's quite some good kind of strategic tips. So we'll talk through examples of reasonable adjustments, alternative employment, those sorts of things. As a general rule for long-term absence, and we normally say, and again, obviously there's always an exception to the rule, but if they've been off long-term for five or six months, we should be at the point of a stage three possible dismissal hearing or ill health retirement, whatever it may be. Um, and I normally say to clients, we probably would have needed about two or three OH reports to get to that point. So if obviously we are dismissing, we've got, three two three oh eight reports with all the medical advice hopefully some adjustments um so in terms of adjustments just quickly um again oh aren't necessarily educational specific so they might make suggestions that uh suggestions sorry that you think aren't great so the big one we get is obviously we refer teachers can you move them out of the classroom and give them a desk-based role that's often a, a big no um, so in that case, it might not be considered a reasonable adjustment. Um, most, if not all, schools should be able to do a phased return or at least offer a phased return and then possibly um, some sort of reduction in, in duties, um, even if it's just temporary. So they're the two ones that I think if you said no to, you, you might start to kind of give rise to a discrimination claim because I think, um, like I say, most employees can do some sort of phased return. I think, should we pause for any questions? Um, well, we would, but you've been so comprehensive, Tom, that we haven't got any questions. So what I'm going to do instead okay. <laughs> is um, I'm going to ask some questions of the delegates. I don't think we've asked the poll about cost of absence, have we? And, no. And tracking absence points. So we've got another question for you, which hopefully should be up on your screen now. 
in your organisation, are, are you aware of the annual cost of absence to your organisation? And this was Tom's point at the beginning in terms of how much of a difference it can really make if you can demonstrate this. And the second question is about how you track those absence trigger points. So Tom's already talked through the importance of knowing the cost of absence in your organisation. Um, and I think often, Tom, the difficulty is that you have in reality is the HR system, doesn't it? It's being able to get the data on that. Yeah. Um, and a lot of you won't have the ability to make change there. But I think this kind of conversation gives you the tools to start having those conversations at a senior level to say, well, there's a real benefit to having this information. Because if we can really see how much money we are losing as an organisation, because there are steps that you can take to really yeah. bring that cost down. Um, and then, Tom, talk about the spreadsheets issue. So, yeah, the second question um, was mainly just a, it was a bit of a sympathetic one. I know some schools, particularly if you're not a big trust, you might not have a HR system. So I know a lot of school business managers, HR professionals, sometimes head teachers are having to kind of hold and manage their own log of who's been off when. And obviously, if you've got a couple of hundred staff and you're trying to keep an eye on, on it in sufficient timing, um, that can be quite difficult. So I just wanted to pick up on that um, mainly in terms of proactive management um, like I say some schools have a really good HR system um, that send automatic reminders so where I used to work I would get an email that says X employee has been off four times next time they are off that will prompt formal absence management and I knew I could just have a quick word with the line manager to let them know they would tell the employee next time you're off it could be formal absence management and straight away that's possibly going to put 50 percent of people going off again um, but if they did hit a trigger i would get an automatic reminder from the system with a template invite to short-term or long-term meeting so like i said i know not all schools and if you're you know stand alone you might not have the resources to do it but it's just thinking are there better ways of managing absence um, I, like I say, I do have sympathy because if you haven't got the resources to do it, you're doing the best you can. But sometimes that's where the issue lies. It's just the, the speed between managing it and obviously uploading and, and making sure the spreadsheet's up to date. Really, it needs to be done daily. And I appreciate you don't have the time to do it, which is where things start to slip. So it's just a bit of a reminder that, you know, are there potentially better ways of doing it? Um, I don't know, as we carry on through the next slides, if anyone that... Um, selected other here if they want to let us know what other options they've been using that might be quite useful for other um, colleagues on the call so um, I'll just move on now um, so OH I think um, Heather did we want to do the poll now or no, later? Let's keep going, I think. fine um, so this is what I mainly wanted to focus on um, the main reason being obviously OCK Health is um, a cost to schools most of the clients I work with really don't rate the OH advice they get um, but obviously it's quite crucial when you get to dismissal stage and demonstrating you've made all the adjustments you can um, so what we're going to look at is the second bullet point a good OH report begins with a good referral so this is where I often see schools going wrong um, or not wrong but maybe not just de developing the um, referrals so um, before I, sorry, I'll just go back here. So, um, one of the big tips I would give, obviously, if, if you're managing long term absence, like I say, you're normally looking at two or three referrals. So, each time you refer, you don't want to be using the same form or the same questions because you'll basically get the same advice back. So, a really kind of common chronology would be your first OH report, you'll probably ask the real open ended questions what can we do to get them back to work? Um, what support can we do? What adjustments can we make? You'll probably get suggestions around phase return um, those sorts of things if you try phase return and it doesn't work and they go off again then in the next referral say we have attempted and offered a phase return however it did not work because if you don't say that you've tried they'll probably just recommend you do it again um, and, not, you, so, and you can put lots of questions on there about what you can and can't do um, as long as obviously you're looking like you can do some things um, and I think one of the other kind of top tips I'd give is don't be afraid to challenge OH advice. Um, I 
always use this example because it never kind of ceases to amaze me, but we had a cleaner um, who had a bad back, so they'd been off long-term sick. We referred to OH and we got a report back saying they are fit to work, but they can't do any bending motion or any kind of mopping, sweeping motion. So obviously for a cleaner, it leaves the question, well, what can they do? So we challenged the report, sent across the JD and said, can you highlight one element of this job that they can do, given your previous advice? And they looked at it and actually changed the referral and said, actually, in hindsight, given this job description, they're not fit to work. So that obviously allowed us to then move on with with other options. Um, so don't be afraid to challenge it. And like I say, the big tip is don't keep using the same form in terms of questions and things. Make sure you update it as to where you are in the process. Um, this is the other kind of big one we get asked. Um, what happens if the employee refuses to attend or doesn't consent to it to be released? So the main thing here is that you have offered it. That's the main thing, it's a supportive approach. It could be argued that there's a contractual obligation that they engage in it, but ultimately if they don't engage, we'll have no option but to continue without medical advice. So what that's gonna do really is it's gonna hinder the employee. Um, and it might be, you know, we, we leave it and try and re-refer. But like I say, the main thing is that we've offered and if they don't engage, it doesn't put the whole process on hold. It just means we'll have to continue without medical advice. Um, obviously, if we continue without medical advice, there are certain things we can assume, such as phase returns, those types of things that I think we should be offering anyway. Um, so good practice. Um, these are just some kind of top tips. So no surprises. Um, so just be careful what you put on the form. A lot of schools sometimes muddy the water, so they'll put all sorts of capability concerns in the report and things that probably haven't been discussed with the employee and probably aren't the right setting to raise those concerns. Um, one of the top tips I would give, um, not sure if you've seen this kind of correlation, but quite often if we're managing somebody with um, capability or disciplinary, they'll often go off sick. Um, and what you can say is that we've started a disciplinary process. We feel the sickness may be linked to that. Um, a big example is obviously stress. I'm stressed because you're taking disciplinary proceedings against me. There's not too much we can do to alleviate that stress unless they engage in the process and we conclude it. So in those cases, you might want to allude to, not de in detail, but you might want to say um, there's a couple of... Um, concerns that need to be looked into or something um, so what to include in the referral these are just some tips I've discussed a lot of this um, so that's just there just kind of for, for background um, questions to be answered like I said, I've discussed a lot of these but I just wanted you to have them um, these are kind of examples I always give the big one I've kind of loosely alluded to it but the second bullet point from the bottom I always ask as good practice, are they fit to attend management meetings? Whether it be a disciplinary investigation meeting, a capability meeting, grievance, or even an absence management meeting, um, because most of them um, will try and, try and kind of dodge the process. Um, so I'll pass over to Heather to talk through dismissals just when this is appropriate. Thanks, Tom. If you could, Tom, can you go down to the golden rules? Firstly, please bear with us. We're gonna go a couple of minutes over. Um, we're doing our best to time this right, um, but it's tricky. Um, somebody's asked a question about whether or not we'll send on the slides. We will do. So you'll get a copy of those. We'll make sure they get sent out. Um, and thanks to Claire who put in a comment about their advice to employ, an, employ a whole apprentice to do lifting and handling for a member of staff, which seems extraordinary <laughs> to see from occupational health. Yeah. Um, so these are the kind of things to think about as your golden rules. Firstly, there is no entitlement to be paid till the end of your sick pay. If you're a teacher and you're on six month full pay, six month half pay, that doesn't mean you're entitled to get that money. If on day one of your absence, it is clear to everyone involved, and it's not usually clear on day one, but a couple of months in, you might be absolutely clear that there is no prospect of this individual returning. Your duty, you have a balance in terms of the well-being of that individual but also appropriate use of public funds there is no right to be paying that money out so from an employment tribunal's perspective where as an employment lawyer that's how i view this they will be looking at what have you done um to put the employee in a reasonable position and do you have enough information to make a decision that em that employee is not coming back 
So on long-term absence, that was my point at the beginning about occupational health. Yes, you'll get occupational health advice, but also you can take it in the round. Have you got any other information from the GP? Have you got a pattern where you just know that they are going to go off sick because you can tell time and time again that's what's happened? If you're going to move away from the occupational health advice, do it with extreme caution, but it can be done if in the picture that you've got as a round, as a reasonable employer, you can demonstrate this is a reasonable decision. And what the employment tribunal look at is, are you acting within what's known as the band of reasonable responses? So if I gave a case scenario to all of you here today, you'd probably fall within a bell curve. There's no perfect answer to any scenario. But what a tribunal looks at is, well, have you acted reasonably within the band of reasonable responses of an employer? So if you're dismissing somebody on day one of absence, no, you're not going to be in the band of reasonable responses. But think about what you do. Um, and I think it's quite a useful test sometimes to think, OK, if I if I ask 100 people on that call, where where do I think I would sit within that? And that is broadly what the tribunal are looking at. Keep the process moving. You can hold sickness review meetings before an individual has returned to work, particularly in stress at work cases. Basically, you have to, otherwise you're never going to get that process moving. If somebody's off work because of stress at work, then that's my son, you can see in the background. Um, if they're off work because of stress at work, you have to have an absence meeting, otherwise you're never going to find a way to get them back into the organisation. Um, the second point is about making balance. Hello, Charlie, can you just wait a minute? It's about making balanced judgments. Um, and that's the point about occupational health. You have to balance it in the round. And the tribunal will have sympathy for that. I've talked about exhausting sick pay. And then the final point is about disabilities. It is very difficult to do to manage somebody who's off sick with disability. <sighs> can you just wait? Um, and I would say it's not one that we can give you all the advice on here and you'd have to take advice on, but do it with caution. So that, luckily for you, if you don't want to hear any more from my son Charlie, is everything we were going to cover in this session. Tom, can you go on to this next slide? Um, if you've been to this session, you will get a mailing about the next sessions. We're going to hold them every Tuesday, I think really for as long as we're in this lockdown situation. If you have found it useful, give us any feedback you want to in the box. Um, and send it, on to, send it on to your colleagues. There's not a limit per organisation. We'll run as many as we can. Um, <laughs> do you want to come say hello? And this is Charlie. It's been a wave. Okay, go see Daddy. Um, and I hope you found them useful. All right. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> thank you. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye.